All right. Um, so we're going to, I'm starting the recording again. Let's pick up from where we paused. Um, just waiting for the recording to start. Okay, so the recording is on. Welcome back to the second um, session here on uh, Christian apologetics. We are continuing our discussion on understanding suffering. Um, let me just pick up uh, the question there from Christopher. According to the Bible, is it wrong to file a court case against someone else? Now, what the Bible does teach us, and this is especially with respect to other believers, and you'll find this in uh, Matthew chapter 18 and also in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, the Bible teaches us to try and resolve uh, problems between ourselves with the help of spiritual leaders or godly leaders. So that's the biblical pattern to resolve problems, um, you know, whatever the problems are. Now, if that does not happen, uh, then the believer is left with no option but to go to the court. So uh, in that case, you know, there is no recourse but to go to the court and get things addressed legally or in a lawful manner. And that is not wrong because government is also an institution given to us by God. That is Romans chapter 13, right? So to answer your question, uh, the first step uh, as believers, especially if both parties involved in the dispute are believers, the first step is to see if that could be sought, solved through the intervention of godly people, leaders, if that's not there, then the, the the second best or the other option that's there is the government, which is the legal system. And it's not wrong uh, because Romans 13 does tell us that those institutions are also established for us by God. Uh, going back to this example I was giving uh, with the same business people, um, you know, way back, maybe 10 years ago, I think there was again a dispute between people. So, and these both sides were believers. Uh, again, it was a business related matter. And I remember we, you know, uh, so the first thing they did at that time was they said, you know, let's let's just go and get get the pastor to help us. And so although it was a business situation, uh, the, the nice thing that happened was they came and met with me. And of course, before they came, I said, you know, we shared all the information, let me have a look, you know, see these things. And then we had a meeting uh, and, uh, you know, and in, in the office, we sat down uh, and, you know, then we arrived at a, arrived at a solution. All right, so, you know, what was owed and what had to be paid and all of that. And then we just sorted the matter out. It never went into a legal court course so that was nice you know at that time and the good thing was uh, both parties were willing to uh, receive that kind of an intervention from a spiritual leader although this was in a business matter and they were willing to do it so that was a good thing and that, that was resolved and the parties moved on uh, but in uh, what's happening right now with this businessman, which I was stopped just telling you about, uh, that's totally a different thing because one side, the one side is uh, they are Christians by name, but not believers, and so they are doing all these things, causing problem. Okay, is that okay, Christopher? Does does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, Okay, let's go back to notes. So what we were saying is sometimes there is uh, suffering that's caused by what other people do. I'll just go a little fast so that I can finish this. Um, and, uh, and you know, um, so when people are against us, people do things against us, uh, you know, we always use the Bible as our 
way of responding, right? That means we don't uh, turn around and uh, we don't, you know, fight, you know, return uh, return evil for evil, like Romans 12 says, right? So even overcome evil with good. That's our guiding principle that, um, uh, you know, when people are doing things against us, um, our goal is to overcome evil with good and we don't fight back evil with evil. But there's nothing wrong in, you know, taking preventive measures to protect ourselves or um, uh, praying for the people and, and, and asking God to intervene and so on. So when, you know, when, when people do things, evil things again against us, again, there, there can be a lot of questions even on this aspect. You know, why did, why did God allow those people to do such things? Why doesn't God just strike them down? Or why doesn't God just change their minds? Or, you know, why is God letting those people do these kinds of evil things against me or against, you know, whoever, the, the believers? Um, why doesn't God just stop them? So, uh, uh, so that kind of brings us to another question: uh, Is you know how do you understand divine protection versus persecution? Because we do have amazing stories of divine protection, you know, where um, uh, uh, as believers, you know, we just say, "God, uh, no evil shall befall me; no, no weapon formed against me shall prosper." And God uh, divinely protects his people from the violence of men. So we have those kinds of testimonies. And then on the other hand, we also have uh, so many people who face the, uh, the, 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 the pain of violence. You know, uh, they are persecuted, they are beaten, they are... All, all things happen. Those kinds of things do happen. And so how do we reconcile it? I mean, why is it that there are these testimonies of people being divinely protected by God? I mean, why was Daniel protected in the lion's den? And yet, why were there so many Christians burnt as torches in Nero's garden and thrown as entertainment to animals, and they died. Why was Paul killed the way he was killed, and Peter killed the way he was killed? And why do we, you know, why didn't God just, you know, powerfully stop it and protect His people? Because after all, His word says, "No evil shall befall you." His word says, "No weapon formed against you will prosper." How do we, you know, we have both these, and how do we reconcile that in our minds? I just like to hear from the class. Um, what do you think? You know, we, we, we're talking about the fourth point: suffering from because of the actions of other people, and we are having both these scenarios. How do you reconcile them in your mind? Um, you, you understood my question or? Uh... Sir, can you please repeat it again, sir? Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we are talking about um, this fourth point that is suffering because of the actions of other people. Now, as believers, we know what the Bible says the promises of divine protection, where the Bible says, you know, no weapon formed against you will prosper, or uh, no evil shall befall you, no plague will come near your dwelling. Uh, he will give his angels charge over you. The angel of the Lord encamps around you and delivers you. The righteous will not be visited with evil. You know, Deuteronomy 28, your enemies will come before you one way, they will flee before you seven ways. Uh, Isaiah 41, you know, everyone who rises up against you, they will be dismayed, they will be, I mean, there's just so many scriptures of divine protection. And yet, uh, divine protection against the actions of men. 
And yet we see both. We see testimonies of people divinely protected. And at the same time, we see people who suffer because of the violence of others. So example, I'm just quoting some examples in the Bible. For instance, we see Daniel divinely protected in the lion's den. We see Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego divinely protected in the fire. And yet in the same Bible, we see Paul was stoned and left for dead. Uh, we see, uh, you know, what happened to Peter and Paul, they were, they were just killed uh, by the Roman Romans, so the Emperor Nero. Uh, we see Stephen was stoned to death. And so many examples. So Hebrews chapter 11 brings out both. You know, it talks about those who stopped the mouths of lions and escaped the edge of the sword and those who were sawn asunder and, uh, you know, uh, suffered. So how do we as believers reconcile the two? Or if you want to look at this, it's very interesting. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, uh, to the church in Philadelphia and to the church in um what was the other church in Sardis or um, I think it was the church in uh, uh, Smyrna. So there are two churches, the church in Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia. To both these churches, the Lord Jesus says, there is the synagogue of Satan that's coming against you. The synagogue simply means the assembly of Satan. That means there are these people who are actually demonically empowered. But to the church in Smyrna, he says, these people are going to attack you. They're going to put some of you in prison. To the church in Philadelphia, he says, I'm going to make the synagogue of Satan come and bow before you. Now, I definitely would love to be part of the church in Philadelphia and, uh, uh, and, and see that uh, the synagogue of Satan comes and worships before the church. But why is it that for the church in Smyrna, it's the same situation, there's a synagogue of Satan, but they are going to be attacked and put into prison. And uh, he says to them, be faithful even unto death. How do you reconcile these two things? You know, on the one hand, there are people are divinely protected. On the other hand, people are attacked and suffer. And these are both believers. How do we reconcile the two? And that's the question. Is that clear, Rupa? Is my question clear? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, can I share, sir? Please go ahead. Uh, my understanding, I came to a reconcile this in my heart. Over the period, uh, in the beginning, I thought I should be protected by God because I have be I believe in him but through the process of uh, this life I have learned that when I need to face persecution God is faithful to give me the faith to stand and take it and I think according to the purpose he wants to accomplish through me he will give me the faith to face it and in sometimes he gives me the faith to be protected in those situations both faith comes from God and I should be willing to understand his plan and purpose for that situation and he is so faithful that he will give me the strength to go through it or overcome it that is the understanding I gained through experience sir. Mm. wonderful Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Very good. Samuel? Um, <clears throat> um, I do think, Pastor, it's, um, I think, to God's glory uh, and his purpose. Like, for example, if Daniel was... Sorry, Sorry. Uh, Samuel, can you hear me? Hello? Uh, yeah, uh, so I'm thinking, uh, 
God's purpose and uh, His glory. Uh, and in 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 situation like like if Daniel was eaten by the lion, and uh, Paul and the apostles never faced any persecution, and if Christianity was readily accepted as the state religion, uh, then probably it would, you know, it the circumstances would be very different. So Daniel receiving divine protection from God in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego receiving divine protection glorified God in a foreign land and made the king of Babylon uh, accept and worship the living God. And uh, the apostles being persecuted uh, encouraged other apostles to then boldly go out and fulfill the Great Commission. Uh, so that's that's how I'm trying to mm. reconcile uh, the two. Mm. Mm. Yes. Okay. Thank you for sharing, Samuel. Um, I see Brother Manohar's uh, comments on the chat as well. Anybody else wants to say something? How do we reconcile these two things, you know, suffering, violence at the hands of people, and then also experiencing divine protection? Kennedy, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's uh, quite an interesting and very really challenging scenario. But I tend to think since we operate again in the kingdom of darkness, we might lose physically, but when spiritually depending on our faith. Because we have a time limit on this kind of situation. They're not permanent. Thank you. Okay. Um, Kennedy and... Um... Sorry, I, 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 I couldn't get what you said. Um, can you repeat it, uh, please? Or can you uh, type Let it out? Yeah, what I'm saying is, eh? we live in a world that is dominated by the, the demonic, by Satan. So it, it, we are operating in the kingdom here on earth. So we are bound to lose physically, but win spiritually. So it's a scenario that is temporary. It's a test on our faith and on our belief. Thank you. Mm, okay. Okay. So what I did here was you said um, we may we may lose physically, uh, but we're beginning spiritually. It's a temporary thing, but beginning eternally. Um, yeah, that's what I kind of got. Is, is that what you were saying, Kennedy? Did I get you right? Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Um, Dina, how do you, how do we reconcile the two? I'm just purposely opening up for the class so that we can think through on this. Uh, Anita says a grain of wheat dies and produces more fruit. Yeah. Anybody else? Like this, I see Samuel, Matthew 5.10. Christopher, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, Pastor, I, um, I mean, my view on it, uh, you know, when you look at uh, things that are happening now and uh, things that have happened in the past. So one of the things, one of the, I mean, uh, one of the worst events that ever happened uh, was the, you know, the persecution of the persecution of the Jews, uh, you know, during the Second World War, mm -hmm. scale and, uh, uh, you know, the, the extent of uh, how they were persecuted, in, you know, in concentration camps. And um, uh, I, I, I just think that, uh, you know, there are, I, I, I think there's sometimes, we, you know, sometimes we cannot reconcile it. You know, and, uh, um, uh, God has, you know, looting uh, and put under the what? The civil. Sorry. Uh, go ahead, Christopher. Um, Charles, you can speak after Christopher. Yeah. So I was just saying that um, the extent and uh, you know uh, scale of of what happened, um, and 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 
how long and for how long it happened also uh, you know evil was probably propagated in in uh, in its um, in its worst way um, uh, and to some extent it you know it, it in, or it's, in small ways it, it happens you know when you read about things that are happening uh, where people are in, in power can do certain things and uh, you know, affect um, uh, people's lives so I think uh, it's uh, my, my um, uh, view on this is that um, sometimes you cannot rationalize you know God um, uh, allows allows uh, allows for it and uh, there are times when he intervenes and uh, we can't uh, I mean we can't really rationalize you know when that when that, when uh, when it ha when he when he does it and when he uh, you know kind of steps steps back yeah Fine. Right. Thank you. Charles, last comment, last set of comments, then we'll wrap this up. Were you saying something earlier, Charles? No. Okay. All right. Yeah. So uh, thanks to each one for sharing your thoughts um, on this. And, uh, and yeah, Anita, go ahead. Pastor, I just wanted to share my doubt. Mm. That is it that because uh, they are not standing in their authority in Christ and uh, not standing on the word of God? Because that is what we have been like. It's the foundation for us, right? And uh, is it that because they are uh, that that's why they are uh, suffering? Or even one more thought I have is like uh, where the God has told that I will not let you be tested beyond your capacity because God knows our capacity. So is that their capacity that they can go through all of it? There's two thoughts I have. Hmm. Um, yeah, and I think, I think uh, the way Rupa shared this was um, really wonderful. Uh, where she said, there is faith in our hearts and sometimes it's faith to go through it and sometimes it's faith to overcome it. So what should we do as, as believers in the light of the fact that there are people who will do evil against us? You know, and sometimes it's evil because we are Christians, and sometimes it's just just general evil in the world. You know, people are just being mean to other people. How, what should we do? And here's here's how uh, you know here's what I want to just say in a, in brief. One is we must believe God for divine protection. That is, we we start with the Word of God. So we are bold and fearless because we believe God will divinely protect us from every scheme of man, right? So we, like Anita was just saying, we stand with faith in the word of God and we believe that as long as, you know, we are doing what God wants us to do, God will protect us. And to that extent, I, I even say like this, you know, we are indestructible when we are in, 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 and I use the word indestructible in, in a limited sense, not, you know, but, but in the will, when we are in the will of God, we are standing in faith in the word and believing that God will protect us. Secondly, we need to do our part naturally to, for our own protection. You know, uh, one of the things we are involved in is uh, you know, trying to help other churches. And um, especially right now in our own state here in Karnataka, um, and actually in other parts of India, a lot of, there's a lot of persecution happening. And uh, so we have this work going on, it's called India Care Project. And some of you are actually helping us on that um, and the India Care Project. And uh, we are calling, you know, we have this database about 11,000 pastors around the country. So we call, we ask how they're doing. And uh, more recently, the recent weeks in our own state of Karnataka, uh, there've been uh, several attacks on churches. 
And uh, one of the things I told one of the people who's, who's, who's on, working on this project is, you know, you need to call the pastors, find out, you know, what is, what is happening, you know, uh, why, uh, um, see, sometimes we are on the wrong side, meaning if a pastor is running a church without having it registered, then it's very difficult to, you know, without legally having that entity registered, it's very difficult to provide any form of help to them when they're being attacked. So I told them, you know, see, find out are these churches registered, you know, uh, or, or are, are these, sometimes, you know, people conduct services in their homes uh, and then they're being a nuisance to the neighbors, but in the sense that, you know, they have this loud worship going on. So obviously neighbors are disturbed and then they call, you know, call these miscreants to come and disturb or do things like that. So then obviously we can't protect them because look, we are at fault. You know, we're running a church in a house and making so much noise. Obviously neighbors are disturbed and they call people to trouble. So, you know, so, so the point is, uh, I told, you know, I told this person, one of the people working on the India Care Project, I said, see, when you speak to the pastors, find out, you know, are they registered? What is, what is the real cause? Why they're being attacked? Um, how long have they been put in jail? How are they coming out? Because you know, then we can know exactly where to help them. But the point is, uh, we need to do what we can to protect ourselves. You know, we have to be on the right side of the law. If we are on the wrong side of the law, and then we try to defend ourselves, actually we are in a, we are in a disadvantageous position. You know, and uh, last Sunday, uh, one of our services, um, our church in Paloda Bazaar, that's in Chhattisgarh, North India, um, our pastor was there, and uh, and uh, these people came out in front of the church, started making noise, and uh, you know, wanting to disrupt, and then immediately they called the police. Police came, and the, the police, local police, were supporting the church, which was so unusual, you know, uh, especially in North India. Uh, and we have a video of that where the policeman standing in front of the church building was supporting the church and uh, he was shout, you know, he was just challenging these people who had come to disturb the service saying, why are you doing it, you know? Now, very important. Now we, we've had these problems happen in the same church several years ago, and but very important was uh, we, you know, we are on the right side of the law. That means, you know, we have our own building, we have our own land. We're not doing anything illegal. It's a registered uh, organization. Uh, we have given all the documents to the police. So legally we're on the right side, you know, we're not, and from there we can, you know, we can, so we, we, we ask for police protection coming. So service on Friday and Sunday, uh, uh, you know, the submitted letter saying, hey, we, we want the police to stand there because we're going to have services and we don't want these people to come and try and hurt the congregation. So the second thing is, you know, we do in the natural what we have to do to protect the church or the you know, to protect ourselves. And there's nothing wrong with that. So our faith is God will protect us. Secondly, we do our part of being, our conduct must be blameless, right? We must do our part in, to protect ourselves. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, Jesus said, when, when they persecute you one city, they flee to another. Why did he say, you know, go to another? Why? Because you're, you're, most, you're more useful to God alive than dead in most cases, right? So, you know, you, you take care of your own life so that you can continue serving God. So you protect yourself. Now, in spite of this, if we have to suffer, it will not shake our faith in God. It's not gonna shake our faith in God. And we will endure it gladly and we count, it, we count it a privilege to be counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Okay, so that's kind of the approach we take. One is 
We believe God will divinely protect us. We use the word of God. Second, we do what we have to do in the natural to make sure we are protected. And third, even if, even if, that's when we say, look, it's, it's, we count it with an honor to suffer shame for his name. So that's kind of the, um, our approach uh, towards this suffering because of, I'm talking from a believer's perspective, from a believer's side, right? Uh, suffering because of other people's actions. Okay. And, uh, and there is nothing wrong uh, in doing what we need to do in the natural to protect ourselves, you know, don't don't think of it as a act and of act of unbelief. No, Jesus Himself said, when they persecute in one city, you flee to another. You you go to a place where you are protected. So there's nothing wrong uh, in doing that. And uh, you know, here in India and in some of the, some parts, we 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 have police. Uh, to stand in front of the in front of the church because say hey, there are these people who are unnecessarily we are not instigating them but they are unnecessarily coming to attack the church and as long as we keep good relationships with the police and say hey you come and you know we've done everything right all our papers are intact everything is right so you're obligated by law to you know uh, protect us uh, we can do that okay uh, any other thoughts on this. Um, yeah, I, 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 and I'm taking this th class a little slow. I didn't expect it to take so much time, but it's it's okay for us to think through uh, on these things. Okay. Yeah. So I see Prabhakar's comment there on Stephen, and I also see Paul um, Beth's comments about Paul when he escaped trouble and times when he uh, went into it boldly. Okay. Yeah, so in, in all these things, and our faith is in God, we are fearless, and uh, we are expecting God to uh, protect us, move on our behalf, and so on. Okay, but, uh, and, uh, yeah. All right, so let's just move on to the next one. I, thank you, thank you for sharing. Okay. Yeah, I'm just seeing the comments in the chat and yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that's this whole issue of divine protection versus persecution, which, which is, um, you know, which is uh, kind of real right now what's happening across India. And uh, yeah, all right, number five. This also might be a very big, big point, is suffering due to divine discipline and judgment. Okay. Now, uh, there are two levels. Uh, uh, and again, I'm sharing my, my understanding here. There are two levels of divine discipline or divine dealings, right? One is what we, what I would call as um, divine discipline. Uh, which is like as a parent lovingly corrects their child. Secondly, there is divine judgment where it's punishment for wrongdoing, right? It's it's God dealing with the wrong that has been done, okay? So there are two separate things, and these have to be understood separately, divine discipline and divine judgment. Now, divine discipline is something we all experience, all of us, okay? And uh, it's what's talked about in Hebrews 12, where he, the writer of Hebrews says, you know, if, if a father doesn't correct his own, and he's, a father, he's talking using a father-son analogy, says, then, um, you know, then uh, you, you're, you're illegitimate children. I mean, if a father doesn't care about correcting, then, he does, you know, you're not even own children, you know? But God corrects everyone whom he loves, he corrects, right? 
but he, he corrects us lovingly. And how does he bring about that correction? Uh, primarily through the scriptures, because all scripture is given for instruction and correction. So the correction happens through the scriptures. And, um, and um, uh, it also happens by the prompting of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit uh, prompts us, uh, he corrects us in our hearts, and then also through other people. So, you know, God can speak to us through other people and tell us, hey, you need to you know, get things right. So, but all of this is God's loving correction in our lives, right? And, um, uh, and, 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 and for most of us, you know, we, are, we recognize this and we yield to the correction, whether it comes through the reading of the scripture, whether it comes through the you know, prompting of the Holy Spirit, or whether it comes through other people, uh, we receive that. We say, okay, God, you're speaking, I receive it. Uh, I will align myself to your loving correction. I will make the changes I need to make and, you know, move forward with that. Now, if a believer is unwilling to respond to God's loving correction coming through his word and his spirit and to other people, then the believer is willfully stepping into disobedience. Right? And, uh, uh, you know, you know uh, God always gives us time to repent, right? That means just because a believer is disobedient uh, one day, or an initial stage of his his or her life doesn't mean fire and brimstone falls from heaven. You know, God doesn't do that. He's giving people time to repent. It's okay, you know, yeah, this person is willfully ignoring my loving correction and going their own way, but I'm going to be patient. I'm going to try to get them back, get them in alignment to what I want for them. And uh, we must keep in mind that, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. So when God has given you a lot of revelation and, and responsibility in the kingdom, uh, the, what he expects from us is also much higher. And the consequence of disobedience will also be much more severe. Okay, let me keep that in mind. And I think it's in James 4 or James 3. Uh, James tells us that, you know, it says, don't be, too many of you don't try to be teachers because uh, you know that you're going to be judged with a stricter judgment. Yeah, so this is in uh, James 3 and verse 1. Yeah, so to whom much is given, much is expected or re required. Now, in divine judgment, this is a place where people have gone way off. God is, you know, they have kind of like extended, they've really stretched God's time for repentance. They've really drifted away. And then God has to call them to a place of repentance. See, in this loving correction, repentance is immediate. We yield to his correction. We say, okay, God, I'm sorry. I'm aligning myself to what you've said in your word or your spirit or you've spoken to me through people. I'm aligning myself. I'm taking corrective action in my life and we move on. So it's simple. Um, you don't find anything happening. And this probably, for all of us, it happens on almost, you know, a weekly basis, a regular basis. This, you know, God, God is dealing with us. And we are walking, you know, very carefully with God. But if a believer walks away into disobedience and, uh, and, 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 you know, God is just giving them time to repent and they refuse to repent, then you find God's discipline God's judgment coming on to call people to repentance. So really this judgment is a call to repentance. And we see a lot of this in the Old Testament. Now, I do want to say that maybe in the contemporary church, we don't actually dwell on this aspect of God very much. You know, a Paul in, 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 in Romans 11, he talks about the goodness and severity of God. This is Romans 11, 22. He tells, he's writing Romans 11, 22, he says, consider the goodness and severity of God. In the contemporary church, there's a whole emphasis on goodness of God, which we need, definitely we need that, because you know, people need to know God is a good God. 
but we don't hear too much of people speaking about the severity of God. That is, hey, look, there are consequences of willful disobedience and an unwillingness to repent. There are consequences. God is a good God. There's the goodness of God, but there's also the severity of God. And uh, Romans 11.22, Paul is saying, hey, consider the goodness and severity of God. You look at how God dealt with his own people, the Jewish people. Uh, there was a goodness of God, but there was also the severity of God. There was a goodness of God extended to the Gentiles, but there was a severity of God towards his own people, the Jews. Right. So uh, we need to keep this in balance. There's, there's the goodness of God, there's a severity of God. And the severity of God is actually really his call to repentance. It's, it's his, his call for us to come back to him. Right. And keep in mind that even in judgment, even in judgment, <clears throat> there is hope uh, of finding mercy and healing. There is hope. Right? Even in judgment, uh, God never judges to destroy. God judges to bring us to repentance. And so therefore, in his judgment, there's actually mercy, healing, mercy and healing available. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, you know, God calling people back to judgment. But now, how does this happen? How does God's judgment bringing people to repentance how does it happen how does he do do it uh, these are things we need to understand right because sometimes uh, the incorrect thing is to attribute every bad thing as God's judgment so for example if a, a believer is you know uh, going down the street and they trip, uh, trip and fall uh, oh God is judging me maybe I did something wrong uh, no, you tripped and fell because maybe there was, you know, a stone on the way or maybe, uh, you know, the footpath wasn't laid out properly. Somebody didn't do their job well or maybe, you know, you just weren't being uh, uh, attentive or, you know, watchful in your step. Yeah, so that's the wrong interpretation of divine judgment because sometimes believers attribute every mishap, every thing that, any wrong thing that happens, a bad thing that happens as God's judgment, you know. And so we need to pause and we need to, we need to understand this aspect of suffering uh, correctly, okay. So uh, our time is up again. Hmm. All right, yeah, are you all with me so far or did I lose anybody? Okay, all right, so we need to um, pick this up, all right, uh, and understand this, meaning there is God's loving discipline, but then there is God's divine judgment. When does that happen? And, uh, you know, and how does God do that? Uh, we shouldn't attribute every bad thing to God's judgment. Some things, you know, if you're, if you're working in the kitchen and you cut yourself, don't say, oh, that's God's divine judgment. <laughs> no, it's, you know, something happened. So uh, we need to understand things correctly. Uh, let's pause here and uh, we will pick this up again next week and uh, hopefully we'll finish this, this whole subject of uh, suffering. Okay, uh, let's go for a break and then I will see you all in the next class. Um, can somebody just pray with us and dismiss us? Um, who would like to pray? All right. Somebody? Okay. Bila, why don't you pray and dismiss us, please? Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, 
Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come into your presence. We thank you so much, Father, for filling us with your comfort, Lord, and your encouragement. Lord, in all of these things, Father, as your word says, blessed to be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is a God of comfort, and he's a God of encouragement, Lord, and he's a God of mercy. So, Lord, we just want to receive that this morning, O oh, Father. Lord, your encouragement and your comfort and your strength, Lord, even as we pass through the season, Lord God, this is not, it is not, uh, you are not unaware of the things that is happening around us. Mm. But Lord, in the middle of all these things, this is our proclamation, like the psalmist says, Lord, that we will go from strength to strength, Lord, mm. till we see you face to face in Zion, O oh God. So we just pray for strength for each one of us and all the believers, Lord, in, in India and across the world that we will walk in strength, God. And Lord, we will see your face, Lord. And we'll also be a strength to others, Lord. And that, as the Bible says, Father, that we receive the comfort so that we can comfort others in the time of trouble. We just pray that we will be comforted and also we will comfort others in the time of trouble, oh God. So we thank you for this teaching, oh God. We receive it and we will pray blessings upon each one of us this day. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll take a quick break and I'll see you in the next class. God bless each of you. Bye now. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Abraham. Hope everything has gone good. Yes, Pastor. By God's grace. Good, good. Thank you. Bye now.